Welcome, everyone, and thank you for listening to the Higher Calling Podcast. I'm Pete Newsom, and this is your source for all things hiring, staffing, and recruiting. Ricky, welcome back. How are you today? I'm doing great, Pete. It's a beautiful day in Central Florida, uh, depending what time of the day you ask me. In the morning, it's absolutely cold, and the and at and noon is summer, and in the evening is fall. So, so you don't like the cold, or you don't? What, what is it? I love the cold, but stick stick around for a little bit more than 11 a.m. Right? Because you know I dress like I'm in Alaska in the morning, and then I pull out the flip flops in the afternoon to go for lunch, and then for dinner the leaves are falling again. It's kind of confusing, Pete. I, I, I'm with you. I, I'm with you, but it's better than snow. Right. Can we, we can agree on that. Better than snow I can under. agree on that because I love snow for a good five minutes. After that, I'm done. <laughs> there you go. Well, I don't, there's no threat of that happening anytime soon here. I think we're, we're good. But awesome. I, you know, I, I, I think we're still uh, it's, it's not that cold yet. So I, I you know, it's we're we're OK. Well, your we're heater okay. didn't go out. Mine did. Mine did. <laughs> My you heater. To, wait, you had to use your heater. What year? You're like 10 <laughs> miles from me. I mean, what, what, what well, was the other day, it was, it was, it was 48 degrees. Right. And it's not just me, right. There's somebody else in my household that really hates the cold. And I mean, she, her, she hating the cold is anything, anything below 70 degrees. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, that's, it's a fight in my household for the thermostat. It, it's a happy day for me when it's cold in the house. I, yeah. I'm, I'm the opposite. But oh, but no, awesome. my uh, my sweet wife, unfortunately, has to suffer. But my logic is that sh you can you can put on layers. You can only, you can't take off. You can only take off so much. And so, you know, it should be cold and, and then act accordingly. <laughs> that's that's the way I approach it. You, you, you do have a point, Pete. There's only so much you could take off before the cops are called. Exactly. <laughs> You're right about that. Exactly. There's children at home. That's right. So. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Awesome. Well, cool. Well, well, we're we're back for uh, an episode. We're going to do something a little bit differently today. You had a disrupt HR meeting that you just um, hosted. Was it last week or was it earlier this week? It was earlier this week. It was a Monday. Okay. Um, we had a disrupt HR Orlando, which is a networking event for HR pros and uh, and business leaders, where they uh, they go on stage. They got a five minute presentation, and uh, they have exactly five minutes to present and 20 slides each slide transition from one slide to the next automatically every 15 seconds as soon as the speaker starts talking they have no control over their 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 presentation it's terrifying it really is terrifying <laughs> is it, so did you present the at this most recent one no actually i uh, so i run i co-run the orlando chapter um i presented for the first five and I think that's enough for the Orlando area to hear me speak. Uh, <laughs> so I wanted to give other people the opportunity to uh, to uh, to do so. But running it is just as stressful. It really is. So I'm uh, I'm sure I, I'd say it's more stressful. But I'm I'm I am wondering why I haven't been invited to speak. Is it because I'm I'm too non HR? Is that why I don't pass the the test? You know what? So so that so that's a good point. This next one that uh, that a summer and I are going to put together, you're coming, sir. Come okay. on over, come on over and speak. But it, it's it's fun. Now, I know how you are. You are just like me. Whenever you go on stage, we don't have an agenda. I mean, okay, we have an agenda, but we don't have notes. We don't have specific things that we read. For people like us, Pete, it is terrifying, right? Because you have exactly 15 seconds to talk about a slide and it's got to transition to the next. And if you go over that time, you're eating up time for your next slide. Next thing you know, you're rushing to the very end. Uh, but you you leave the stage, the, the stage sweating, you look back at your video, and uh, you punish yourself for the next time because you keep looking at over and over again what you should have done or could have done. <laughs> but it's, it's fun. It really is a good time. So the next one, you're coming. How, how many speakers per event? We have anywhere between 8 and 12. 8 and cool. 12 I'll speakers. I'll decide it for four of the slots and problem solved. <laughs> I'll, I'll just... I'll just do that. <laughs> All right, so okay. we got speaker one, two, three, four, five, and then the rest of the four is Pete. <laughs> <laughs> got it. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I was at this event, Pete, and, you know, it's the whole point of this is to network. That's it. To HR people and business leaders, just let their hair down. It's PG-13 rated R-ish, right? If, uh, if profanity and edgy content is not your thing this is not the place for you wow look look at you <laughs> hr folks going nuts what? oh that's right we know how to have a good time there pete and 
all it is is just drink beer, alcohol, and just talk crap. No, I'm just kidding. I, it, it's, it's, we do have a great time. But, you know, in networking, everybody kept asking the same kinds of questions. And I see this every single year. They keep asking the same kinds of questions, different people, same tone, which kind of lets me know this is what people are worried about. This is what they're worried about in 2022. This is what they're worried about in 2021. So I knew that you and I were doing this podcast today. So I'm like, you know what? Let me collect all these questions and let me let Pete know. Now, for the folks who don't know, Pete and I had a conversation about this where I'm just going to peg, peg him with these questions. He doesn't know these questions are coming. He knows questions are coming. He doesn't know <laughs> which questions are coming, right? So uh, let's see how this goes. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. Let's okay. do it. All right. So me walking around, had, you know, a beer in hand, talking to people, talking to business leaders, and these are the kinds of concerns that they have. So here's the first question that I'm going to throw at you. All right. So, Pete, it's definitely an employee's market. What ideas do you guys have to fully engage a candidate in the recruiting process? Well, it is, in fact, an employee's market, the, the strongest employee's market any of us have ever seen. And I, and I, and I say that with confidence because the, there are millions of job openings, millions of more job openings than there are job seekers. I think that comes up every time we talk. And so I think the first step is to acknowledge that. And a lot of companies have it. Um, you know, staffing is, uh, is always a challenge under any circumstances, but it's, it's a really significant one now. And you have to acknowledge the situation that we're in, which is, as an employer, you're not in charge. You, you have to make the, uh, your opportunity and your organization attractive to, uh, to, the, to the job seekers that are out there. I mean, it is classic supply and demand at, at play. And there's been a big adjustment in, in many areas right now. As you well know, there's the adjusted salaries up significantly, and that's, that's growing even more. I just saw that the infl inflation numbers that came out earlier today, 7.5% stated inflation. That, that is, and that's the government's number. That's the yeah. one they're admitting to. So <laughs> when you look at it, it, what, and this comes up often on our podcast over the past few months. We, what we all get to see are the, oh, um, the, the tables in restaurants that can't be seated because there's no servers. Yep. Uh, we, retail stores that can't open because they, they don't have workers. I mean, that's what we all see, but that is playing out in corporate locations. It's playing out across every department that you can think of. We just don't have as much visibility to it. And so those organizations that are adapting and making it attractive to prospective employees are going to win. Uh, those who aren't are going to not be able to open their doors. They're going to not yeah. be able to, to staff. So I think you have to keep candidates engaged by offering them what they're looking for. And you have to understand what that means first. And, and so in many cases, it is compensation related, given the increasing costs that we're seeing everywhere. Um, but in other cases, it may be a flexibility with work schedule. It may be um, you know, virtual options to, to work. So yeah. I think you have to understand your, your candidate base and then act accordingly. But the biggest, it, the most important answer to that question to me is, you have to be willing to change and adapt to the situation at hand. And we know being in, in staffing, not every company is, you know, some are, are fighting it tooth and nail and that's not going to play out well. It's not Pete. And, and I want to touch on something you just said, you have to listen to them. You have to listen to them. And that's something that we kept talking um, at the, uh, at the event as well, that we have to listen, but above and beyond listening, because that, 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 that is what everybody's talking about, is for the people who say no to you, wherever they fall off in that process, ask them why. Ask them why. Why is this not the great opportunity? Don't get me wrong. I would love to convince you, but I don't want to convince you, but I would like some information as to why is it. And if folks would, would, would take stock into that, take inventory into that every single time, some years are going to go by, you're going to have historical data that you'll be able to correlate what they're looking for in correlation with what the market is. 
and what's happening in the market. And then you'll be able to predict, make some changes before you're able to look for somebody or interview and not during the process. So what you just said is spot on to what everybody's talking about. But Pete, everybody told me the same thing. Ricky, you're telling me that, yes, we need to be able to, uh, to listen to what they have to say. We got to get our business partners to understand that. And it's, and it's much harder to do with a bigger organization where you can't just adjust compensation, adjust PTO, adjust vacation. So spot well, on with that. You're going to have to, yeah. right? I mean, that, that the, you can stay stuck in your ways, but you're going to be your own worst enemy in, in those situations. And, and we're seeing that play out. I mean, there's companies that are struggling to stay in business right now because of either inability to act or unwillingness to, I, I don't know what, where that difference really lies, but generally speaking, I think you're right. The bigger the company, the harder it is to, to turn the ship. Um, mm -hmm. But you, you, I, you mentioned years of collecting data. I, that's a luxury companies yeah. don't have right now. They yeah. have to act faster. And that, that makes, you know, you, I know we've talked about this a lot with you coming from large organizations to our significantly smaller one. <laughs> You're still, you know, it, it's, we move a lot faster and that's probably an understatement. That is an understatement, Pete. I'm still, it, it's what, nine months into my term and uh, my term, <laughs> listen to me, what am I, an elected official? Nine months into my employment. <laughs> I <hope> not. <laughs> no, I'm not, trust me. I'm staying far away from that venue. And I'm still shocked, right? It's uh, just the other day we had a question that came up and I'm like, I don't know, I'm like, no, wait a minute, I'm not over there anymore, I'm over here. Hey Pete, what do you think? Hey Stacey, what do you think? Yeah, sure. Awesome. <laughs> Let's make that right. So. That's it. That, that, yeah, that just saved you five follow-up meetings and, and oh, committees and, and, and polls and surveys and all that stuff, right? You know one thing I don't miss? Meet the meeting to plan the meeting to plan the meeting. I don't miss that. I'm glad we don't do that here, man. So thank you for that. <laughs> so, all right. So, so we talked about what we need to do to keep them engaged in the, in the recruitment process. So let's make believe that we still got somebody um, well, still got that. We have all the employees that we want, right? We saw in November, 4.5 million people left their jobs. It, it, it's people are the great resignation is still happening. So how can we ensure as business leaders, how can we ensure our employees, our current employees will stick with us, our current ones will stay with us in an employee's market. How can you ensure it? You can't. That, that's, that's the first thing that it's needed to acknowledge. Um, you know, employees walk, talk, think, ha, ha, form their own opinions, and, and those opinions are, um, are fleeting. They can change day to day. And, and I think that's how it should be. The, the employee, employer relationship is not meant to be a marriage. Um, right. in this, and I mean that in the sense that, well, let's hope that people go into marriage with a, a lifelong commitment, right? Yeah. To me, it's, it's, it's very different than that. It's a day-to-day -day commitment. And I, maybe to some degree, healthy marriages should be that too, right? Yeah. Don't take either side for granted. That, that's really the point. So I would say you have to uh, give and the employee, say it a little differently. The employee needs to make a decision every day whether to drive to work or, or not. And the, the employer has to provide a reason to continue coming and to continue showing up. Now, the other side of that coin, of course, is the, the employee needs to continue to work and behave in a way where they're gonna be invited to continue coming. This really is, a symbiotic relationship in that regard. But I, I think you can't, and nor should you try necessarily as an employer to force someone to stay um, because that's not realistic anyway. But the right people, uh, you, have, you wanna make sure you have the right people there. Now, all of that, that aside, you, you the goal should be to give employees a reason and and to, to focus on that. Um, but I don't think, uh, I think there's gonna, it's natural for there to be a lot of shifting right now. It's natural yeah. for there to be a lot of changes because com every company should be looking at internally and deciding, are we operating the way that we need to, to not only survive, but to thrive in this changing world. And so there's hard decisions that need to be made um, along the way, especially because employees are looking for things as i mentioned earlier beyond compensation while that's always a big piece of it 
um, it's only a piece of it. So I, I think that shift is going to be possible. And you, the same thing still applies as we talked about a few minutes ago. You do want to ask, right? yeah. what, ask your employees what, where they stand. Ask their empo- your employees about their future um, and what their objectives are. I mean, that has to be a big piece of it. But with so many changes going on, those, those things aren't going to re- necessarily remain a- aligned. And yeah. I-, I just think that's a natural part of, of, of the deal. I mean, your job turnover um, is greater now than ever because we're seeing some pretty extreme hiring practices going on with the increased comp. Uh, we, we see it every day in, in our business, but, um, yeah, I think that's just, I think it's just a natural uh, thing that's happening right now to some degree that you may not like that answer though. No, no, actually I do. I do because it's what you're saying, Pete, is that they, that we got to keep in tune with, with our current employees. Once we bring an employee on, let's not forget about that employee, right? Let's, let's continue to talk about what that employee's career aspirations are. Is it to move up? Is it to go into a different department or just to be an expert to where they are? Let the employee become your GPS, right? Or the other way around. You become the GPS for your employee. The employee puts in where they want to go and you as a leader, as an organization, should help them guide to see what they like because if as an organization, I personally believe that if we keep, if we take care of what the employee deems as important to them, they will take care of what's important for the organization. I truly, honestly believe that, right? And I've seen a lot of situations with a lot of other businesses that just forget about the employee as soon as they woo them in with the recruitment practices. So it, it's, it's, we're saying the same thing, just a little bit differently. Yeah, I th- you know, there's there's limitations though on what is realistic to offer right in terms of how if you ask an employee as i think you should to your point to genuinely understand what is it, what their goals are what their objectives are but if it if it becomes clear that you can't accommodate those goals and objectives that's okay it's not the desired outcome mm-hmm. you know you, you i said it's not a marriage well i'd love to go into every, I think we should go into every relationship intending it for, to be the last one, right. That that, that we have. Um, but you're not making a lifelong commitment. You're making a commitment day to day. I've always thought of it that way. Um, being in contract staffing, we, it's really no different than being a a direct employee somewhere. Um, that relationship needs to be evaluated constantly with both sides, giving the other side reason to maintain it. But there's going to be a point often there's going to be a point where it doesn't make sense to continue it. And, um, I, I'm a big believer that being honest and open in those discussions, um, are, are okay. How can I not be? I've quit every job except for this one. And uh, yeah, so, not every relationship is going to last and, and, and you shouldn't try to force a square peg into the round hole where it doesn't make sense. However, within reason, yeah, you want to accommodate each other, accommodate each other, right? Employees yeah. should make concessions. The employer should make concessions when it's done right. That, that, that should be it. But you know, people change situations change and they're changing rapidly right now. So turnover is inherent. I, I, I think it's part of the deal. You know, it's, it's, how you compare this to a marriage is spot on, right? Because where where things that where where a marriage fails, right, is is when you don't say, you don't do what you say you're going to do, right? But if you're open and honest about everything you're about to do, you're going to do, or you have done, same thing at work. If there's a leader who's having a conversation with an employee, trying to fully understand what that employee wants, the employee wants something that's out of our league that we can't afford, or it's not our process. Don't tell the employee, yeah, I'll look into it, I'll make it happen, and then it doesn't, right? because that's a guaranteed fail for you. But if you say, you know what, I'm going to be honest with you, Johnny, we can't do that here, right? And here's why. Here's why we can't do it, because the financial, just be upfront and honest. He may not like it right then and there, but he'll know you gave him the right authentic answer. Now, if he doesn't like it, that's fine. Johnny can leave, right? Johnny can leave, go somewhere else, but I would still try, well, I can't do this for you, Johnny, but what else can I do? What, right. what can I do within my power to help you with that? But if Johnny still, still doesn't like it, just like a marriage, 
you can go ahead and leave. Divorce lawyers make a lot of money in this country. <laughs> <laughs> no, but even though marriage is, you know, in theory, you know, till, the intention is to be, you know, to till death do us part, right? But I, I think every day, I just celebrated my 26 year anniversary a couple weeks ago. But I realize that every day my wife has a choice. Does she want to stay with me or not? And yeah. and and it's, it's it's incumbent upon me to give her reasons to keep you know, to stay there. But I also think it's incumbent upon her to do the same. And so that, that is, that's a, there has to be effort and thought and communication put into the relationship. But I think what we're both saying is there's a point where you may be, there may be irreconcilable differences, but be professional, be open, be honest and communicate those. And, um, and then, and then part on, on good terms if that's what's necessary. Well, that goes hand in hand with my next question, right? Because right now we're talking about what an organization can do to keep somebody, but let's get more granular. Let's get more detailed. So what skill set do you think a leader needs in order to keep an employee engaged? So we were just talking about the organization, but what about the leaders of the organization? What is the most important skill set they can have in their arsenal where they can keep an employee engaged? Should we keep the relationship theme going here? Um, well, it, it seems to I have a thought process on it, but yes, relationship theme, but I do have a thought process on that. Uh, so same things that would apply in any healthy relationship, really. You know, attentiveness is one. Pay attention to what's going on. You know, observe, um, be engaged at, at, because, of your, because you're present, you're paying attention. Ask, ask, it's simple. Um, that doesn't always work in, in marriages, but um, you know, it, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nothing's wrong. Okay, um, but in a in a um, in in the in this setting, the more open dialogue you can have, the better. Um, to I think that's universally applicable. Um, how often it's done, I, I, you know, I, I don't I don't really know. Probably not as often as it should be. Um, because I don't think you can do it too much uh, to, yeah. to stay engaged, ask questions, be attentive. I mean, those are the things that immediately come to mind. What, uh, what would you say to that? From, so I'll start off with saying this, Pete, about 10 years ago, 10 years ago, I was doing a presentation on generational gaps, right? You know, baby boomers, Gen Xers, and, and stuff like that, right? And I'm teaching leaders how to interact with the different types of, uh, of, uh, of generations, right? And then um, we stopped at millennials because when I was doing this, millennials was the, was the latest one. Gen Z wasn't out yet. I mean, it wasn't even, even a thought. I don't even know what the one is right now. What's the one right now? Is there, <laughs> it's, I have no idea. <laughs> I, I, it, I don't know. I, I've Gen seen Z. it, but I, I, don't, I, I don't even know. Yeah. By the way, we're the only country in the world that does that. No other country does that. Generational gaps. It's just us here in the U.S. Yay. So look, so um, it, so somebody asked me a question and they're like, Ricky, so I want you to, I don't want you to teach us right now what's happening right now. I want you to teach us what to expect later on. And I told the guy, I, I don't know because I don't know what that's going to be. Pete, and then it hit me. I'm doing it all wrong. I'm not going to teach people how to interact with different communication styles. I want to teach people how to be flexible. If you're flexible in your communication, you're flexible in your empathy, you're going to be able to tackle anything. So from that point on forward, I'm like, you know what? Forget generational gaps. I'm going to start teaching flexibility. Because the, and empathy and flexibility, because those are two things that a leader needs to succeed today. Flexibility. What does that mean? If if a leader grew up in their career with a specific leadership style, they have to fully understand the leadership style they grew up with is in their career is completely radically different than what they're currently seeing right now, right? So the people who are going into the workforce right now don't have the same style of work or work ethic as they did growing up. So they have these false expectations that they're going to work how they did and then they start clashing. But if you shift that mindset and you're like, this is a completely different generation, they grew up differently than I did, I have to be flexible and understanding and empathetic to their needs. Although I don't give them the value they do, I have to respect the value they give their needs. So there's the empathetic, uh, the, the empathy and flexibility. So to me, that is key for a leader to have. I think you nailed it. 
I think that's a yeah. that's a that's a really good answer. That's that's a that's a difference between ha- knowing what questions coming and uh, and not. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait, 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 wait. We had this conversation on Monday. Well, not you and me over at Disrupt HR, and that may have been the Scotch talking, but it worked out pretty good. You, you, you came, good. you were as smooth on Monday uh, in, uh, as you were now. Okay. Well, you well, am I not always? Come on, Pete. All right. <laughs> All right, moving right along, Ben. All right, so we talked about recruiting somebody to keep them engaged. We talked about how to keep people here, what leaders need to have. This next one I like, and the reason I like this one is because we tend to forget about this group of people. You interview folks. Obviously, you've got one position to fill, but you got three or four people who you interview with, and you're like, man, they're all awesome. They're all great, but you can only offer the position to one. What do you do with the other four? Do you cut ties with them? How do you keep them engaged? How do you keep that relationship going with that, with those folks who did not get selected for that position? And you build that network. That way, you're able to tap on that on that uh, relationship later on in case a position does come up. So how do we how do we keep those folks engaged with the relationship with the organization for the position they didn't get? You know, it's hard for me to answer that mm-hmm. without answering from um, as a staffing guy, because that is a huge component of, of our recruiting efforts when we when we're doing it right, to stay in, in touch with candidates, um, you know, to have a strong pipeline for future opportunity. So we end up, uh, as, as every staffing company does, filling the same positions, position types over mm-hmm. and over and over. So to have a strong candidate pool is a huge advantage in our space. So it's really incumbent upon us to stay engaged with uh, those individuals who are strong candidates who, as you said, didn't get selected for whatever reason. But we, you know, we think of them as keeping that relationship warm. Um, it's it's a really hard thing to do, even in our space, where that that's the sole purpose of, of a staffing company is to provide the best candidate um, in you know quickly, not yeah. not to let, let it drag out. That's what you guys do on the HR side. That's a joke. <laughs> Yay! Not really, kind of. <laughs> but but <laughs> I'm ready, bro. <laughs> yeah, I just I just lost we just lost some clients. I think, but the um, no, but but tr- truthfully, we do serve that uh, that. Um, that purpose by being really efficient in what we do because we only recruit. We don't have all of the other uh, things that come along with, with being in HR. Um, so you know, there's a reason why we're more efficient. Um, but you, you have to do it. First of all, you have to plan to do it. That, that's number one. You have to have a system. You have to have a strategy. I don't think it's a natural thing to do necessarily because we move on, right? Even if when our intentions are good, if we don't have a plan, we're probably not going to do it. So for us, we, we use tools. We use, uh, we use the the technology that's available to us to, to, um, to keep those candidates, um, aside so we can stay in touch with them, but it's conscious. I'll tell you that it doesn't just happen by accident. So I think it's a really important part of the process and, and the best recruiters will do it, um, with consistency, how you do it in, in corporate HR is a, is a heck of a question because, yeah you're limited on time to begin with back to a staffing company being more efficient in recruiting because we have blinders on, so to speak, right? We don't, we don't get distracted by other things. So I don't really have a great answer to that, Ricky. I think you can't realistically probably keep in touch with that many people um, unless you just do it through automated tools, which is um, perhaps impersonal, but effective where if your goal is to stay in front of, those candidates keep your brand to keep your name in, on their mind. Um, then there are uh, no limit of no shortage of tools out there yeah. that that will allow you to have mass planned communication uh, automatically via email um, by default. So that's that's one way. Well, you know what, Pete? It, it's it's I'm thinking about this question right because I'm I. Th- you're right. In corporate America, it's very different, right? That would be really time consuming because how big of a machine that churns. But I think we have a process that even before then, even before a candidate is interviewed, we build a profile. 
on a candidate. Yep. And we keep a database on that. Yep. So even if that person we kept the database on, that person does not get that position, we still got them in, in the profile. So we're already ahead of the game here at our Four Corner Resources because we build that profile first. Now, obviously, the whole point of that is to make sure we got the right candidate for the right position for the client based on their specifications. But in case that doesn't work, go right back to the starting point. Go right back to the, to the profile. And how I was thinking about it, it is time consuming, but if we can just put a process together, this is just anybody, corporate America as well, put a process together where we have a luncheon, come on in, check out what we got. Let's have a, a, a quarterly job fair where, where we invite previous candidates or even a, a round table and ask them questions. What, what do you want? What do you want out there? It's a lot of great information out there. That's kind of the answers that was going around over on the floor at Disrupt HR and I'm like, that needs to be a topic on its own. That really yeah. needs to be a topic on its own. So, okay. Well, it, it, yeah. this is, it's, it's hard to answer out of context too, at least for me, because let's take your position mm -hmm. at Four Corner. Well, it, there's only one of you and yeah. we're not gonna, you know, we don't have intent in plans to have um, a, you know, a second person in that role anytime soon. So it would almost be disingenuous in a way to try to keep candidates warm for, for your role and give them um, a promise yeah. of, or hope that we may be adding to it anytime soon. So I think you have to be conscious of what the situation is as well versus our recruiter roles, which is where if we're growing as an organization, we're gonna hire, um, we have indefinite plans to continue hiring there. We can only hire so many people at any given time. So in that scenario, it absolutely makes a lot of sense. So now we're talking about Four Corner is you know, internally, right? Yeah. Four Corner of the company, not not for for staffing. Yeah, we absolutely want to keep um, keep in touch with those folks. Do do we have as good a plan to do that as we as we do with our our candidates for staffing roles? Probably not. Yeah. Maybe we need to improve it. I, I, that may be um, because it, it, I totally agree with you that it um, it's in our interest to. To keep that pipeline going for sure yeah. but it is it is it's, it's it takes some to man hours though yeah it, it, it's we people do have to pay for it though but you know what pete this next one doesn't even it, it's not even in the same realm as the as the first four but i'm going to ask her it ask it anyway now you said five questions so is this is this you told me we were one doing, coming up five for me this is the yeah. last one okay. yeah last one last one all right so look you've been doing this for 16 years. You've owned this company for 16 years, staff agency. So it's safe to say you're pretty good at interviewing, right? I, That's safe to say, right? Yeah. Maybe. Uh, we'll, we'll, come on. we'll see. That's for someone else. That's for someone else to say, but yeah, okay. sure. Got it. I, I, so, let's say I've done it a, a, a fair amount of it. How's that? All right. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. So yes. Yes. Have you ever had a situation where a candidate is extremely rude to you in the interview process? Like really, like called you a name or dropped some f bombs or was really inappropriate. Oh man, I'm sure I have. I, nothing immediately comes to mind. Um, I, I've had some candidate I, candidates certainly be, you know. So internally, not, none Im immediately comes to mind. I've had some bad interviews. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Some people who just you know were or uh, I don't know, I don't know what they were thinking with some of the things they said or <laughs> they were nervous. The they behaved. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I know I think it goes beyond that. Nerves are yeah. fine. Ner nerves yeah. I can deal with, but just yeah. uh, so there's some there's some weird things we've seen. But I've been pulled in off on a number of occasions throughout the years where one of the recruiters has experienced that and uh, you know, I've stepped in. It's been a while since that's happened, but in our you know, earlier days where I was closer to the day-to-day -day of the business and um, yep, that, that would happen. So I, I will say, yes, I have encountered that a, a number of times, but usually as the next person to come in. Well, the, it, so, that, so that's the question. How do you handle a candidate who is extremely rude in an interview? And it, re, and it reminded me of, of a situation I had about five years ago where I was on an interview panel, it was me and my colleague, and the person we were interviewing started to hit on my colleague. Not just asking her out, but making inappropriate comments about her cleavage, her legs, her body, her mouth, until the point that like, hey, okay, you know what? We're gonna stop this interview right now, right? Right now, 
you're making me feel uncomfortable. I'm not speaking for her. I'm speaking for myself. You're making me feel uncomfortable. This is inappropriate. I'm um, stopping this interview right now. Oh, dude, my bad. I'm sorry, man. I'm an effing idiot. No, look, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, we're stopping right now. Thank you. And he tried to get out of it, but I had to, no pun intended, nip it in the bud right there because I could tell I could tell she was really worried, really uncomfortable, but she didn't want to push him away because she knew how bad I wanted to fill this position. But yeah. I don't want this position filled bad enough to where the person I'm working with is being talked down to and feels uncomfortable at work, right? So I just stop that interview, send them away. Now, I did have a situation where somebody started being a little bit too rash on how he handled a situation before because we did ask him, how do, you, how do you handle a stressful situation? He started saying that, I'll go out back and i punch the wall a little bit and start doing all these things. And I'm like, yeah, look, dude, <laughs> we continued with the interview, but I threw him a couple of bones because I'm like, look, when you give him us an example, do me a favor, give us an example that doesn't involve violence, right? Now, I may have done myself a disservice because the more he told us, the more information I would have uh, I've had to not hire that person, which we did not, right? But I guess I'm saying that because sometimes you can let the person go, but sometimes depending on how they're making somebody feel, I need to stop it right then and there. Yeah, so I don't know if we, you have anything we, like that. So well, we we place gosh, we placed just under a thousand candidates um, last year in 2021. So to get to that point, we you know, our recruiters probably spoke to. You know, hundred thousand candidates yeah. through through that through that through the year. That's about right. And so some of the conversations do turn south. Um, there's people who don't like recruiters when they call. They 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 for various reasons you know, that'll happen. So it it happens with frequency with with our recruiters, unfortunately. And now I'm thinking back to my recruiting days. I, I didn't. Yeah, you know, it's been so long since I've 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 been in that seat, but. Yeah, I had a lot of rude candidates over, over the years. Now that I'm thinking yeah. about it, and to me, that it, like the early in the conversation, someone's going to be on their best behavior. Um, now we we have to give candidates a little bit of a break because uh, if, if when we're calling them out of the blue, maybe they're in a you know, they're, they had a bad day. They're not expect that's different than an interview, right? That's just yeah. us calling. We we have their resume. They it may be an introductory phone call. And so we've seen it then in actual interviews. It doesn't happen as often. I think it's more of when when communication gets crossed, uh, where perceptions aren't aligned, um, there's confusion, misinterpretation of something. That's where I've seen these things typically arise um, other than just some you know, kind of there's always going to be a number of just <laughs> wacky people out there who are just going to be you know, bad seeds, right? And, yeah. and we don't encounter them often, but it does come up. And when I said that they're going to, someone's going to be on their best behavior earlier, early in a relationship, you have to assume that if, if they're going to be rude in an interview, <laughs> then it's not going to improve over time. And right. so we don't, you know, we don't um, have any, 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 real tolerance for that stuff. Well, in well, like you, you said, we're going to end it quickly. We're going to, we're going to move on and we're going to part agree that it's not a good fit. Um, and, and just part ways and, and, and end it there. So, um, yeah, there's, there's look, I, people make mistakes. People, you know, people, um, you know, no, no one's perfect. And so, um, we can all give each other a break with those things, but, there's never a reason to be nasty to another person. Yep. There's never a reason to be hostile. There's never a reason to be aggressive. There's never a reason to use bad language in a, in a professional setting. It's just, there's just certain things that are inexcusable. And when you encounter one of those things, the best thing, in my opinion, to do is just in the relationship or communication, phone call, whatever it is, as quickly as possible yep. and just move on with your life no, and, seriously. Uh, You're and right. put it in the past. Yeah, That's the best way to approach it, Pete, because, you know, especially these days where – it's it really is a hot market for for candidates right they have their pick so you get recruiters that are stressed you get recruiters that are stressed they have to fill all these positions people are leaving they have to fill those positions for the people that are leaving and i'm not saying this is happening but i can see this happening from a recruiter's pr uh, pr uh, perspective they want to make sure they get that requisition filled the stress all these things are happening they may overlook some things to fill that position I'm telling for, uh, for everybody lit, 
listening out there right now, never tolerate any kind of disrespect. Exactly how you said, Pete, when you said that this is where they're supposed to be putting their best foot forward and this is it, it's not going to get better. <laughs> It's no. not going to get better at all. So no, you know, I don't no, care so, how stressed yeah. you are. Don't bring that person into the organization. Yeah. If on the first date, uh, <laughs> that, you know, that, that, you know, that your, your potential spouse is, uh, is a complete nightmare, you know, they're probably not going to be the person you marry. Right. You're right. So, I mean, well, some people are like, oh, well, you know, I'm 60. Well, I guess he's a serial killer. Fine. All right. I guess I'll just keep all knives away. <laughs> um, no, you, but what, what you said is, is there's a lot of truth to the, this market at times driving bad behavior because while employers are well aware at this point, or if they're not, they should be, that it's a candidate's market, candidates are also well aware of that. And you see some bad behavior that you wouldn't normally, uh, say you wouldn't have seen in 2008 um, when our phones were ringing off the hook, not with clients looking to hire, but with people who were unemployed, um, you know, looking for, for a job. Uh, that was a, an awful situation. And unfortunately, is supply and demand being what it is, creates certain behavior. Um, but to any candidate who's listening, don't burn a bridge. It's never worth it. If it's not a good fit, it's not a good fit. If it's if you're a recruiter listening, corporate or third party like, like Four Corner, just just end it i mean you can end things quickly without being equally rude don't don't lose your temper just because someone else is is being um is being rude there, there's <laughs> you, i mean it's easier said than done it is but you, you'll always be glad that 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 you you held on held your composure um it, it's a uh, this happened to me about some time ago um i interviewed a manager for the uh, call floor over for a uh, um a uh, call center it was a team manager and uh he just it, it's it's he had all the right credentials, but just he he didn't do good in the interview, right? So I got this rule right for the final three. I give them a call person. I don't send an email. I give them a call and say, hey, um, thank you for the interview. Really appreciate your time, but we're gonna move with somebody else. Um, is it okay if I give you some feedback to help you? And um, sometimes that turns out great. Sometimes it doesn't. This guy went <laughs> off on me, Pete. Dangerous. This guy went <laughs> off on me. This guy was like. You guys are f idiots and this like that. You have no idea what kind of a leader I am. Blah 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 blah. You've made the wrong blank 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 move and started. And I just let him finish, right? And as soon as he was done, I'm like, okay. So what am I supposed to do with that information now? <laughs> <laughs> am I supposed to say, damn it, you're right? <laughs> you know what? You know what? I don't know what I was thinking, Joe. Uh, let me go ahead and bring you on board, right? Because that is an example, Pete, of burning a bridge. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I think you, well, you should have said, as well, you just, you just solidified that we made the right choice. Well, you, well, right. exactly. What you're supposed to do is make me feel bad for not picking you, and by and by making me feel bad is that wow, I really passed up a great candidate. I screwed up. That's what you're supposed to do. But when you prove me right. <laughs> Right? And you just go off on me in a tangent. I have to wonder, what is your goal here? Is your goal here to make me to change my mind? Because you're doing the exact opposite. You're solidifying the reason why we didn't pick you. But yeah, it, it's uh, it's I. I just wanted to share that piece because uh, when you well, give those, well, those are hard backfires. calls to make, right? <laughs> yeah. you, you making those phone calls uh, for to tell. It, no one likes to be disappointed. No one likes to lose, especially. Yeah something as, as significant as, as a career opportunity. Um, so it, that's that's a really um, kind gesture to do and a beneficial one for those who take advantage of it because yeah. I think understanding why you didn't get hired is a, is a valuable lesson uh, for anyone. It, it, I haven't been hired for every job that I've applied for or, or interviewed for, uh, but I wanna know why. Uh, I, I used to want to know why over the years, so I can improve the next time and and make a change. And yeah. if there is an opportunity, as as we talked about a few minutes ago, to be considered for the next role that opens up, then you know, maybe you have a chance to um, uh, to to win the second time around. So, um, just you know, no one we don't like to lose but there's there's valuable lessons that come with it and there is that's it, it, that's and, often overlooked and if anybody out there's listening right now if you're planning on doing that one 
crucial piece of information that I didn't mention that I should mention if you're going to do this, if you're going to call somebody to give them some feedback, make sure you're clear up front that a decision has been made. There's no negotiating at this point. This is just purely to give you feedback to help you as to what happened, why you didn't get the role, right? If you don't say that, if, if you don't make that clear, they're going to get defensive that, well, I should have said this. I actually have, it, it's, negotiations are over, <laughs> right? This yeah, is no. purely for feedback to let you know, if you want to take it, that's fine. If not, that's perfectly okay. We'll keep your resume on file for six months and then go from there. So. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> look, they're hard calls to make. They're, it's hard to make a call and terminate someone. And yeah, I think the same, the same thing you said applies in that regard. Make sure you clearly state up front that it's not a negotiation at that point. Um, very unpleasant thing to do for all, all around, but it's part of it. And how you conduct yourself in those situations is, um, is, is you know, says a lot about who you are as a person, how you would be to work with in the future. And it is a really, really, it's a round world. It's a small world, but it's a round world where you never know who you're going to be encountering next and in what scenario you're going to encounter that person. And I have countless stories about clients becoming candidates, candidates becoming clients, mm. and it really is a round world. It may not seem like that in the moment, um, but you never know. You just <laughs> never know. So always assume that you're, you're going to want a relationship with that person going forward, even though at that particular moment you, you don't see it. There's a good chance that that'll change. Well, Pete, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there listening right now, not listening to the show, obviously, but elsewhere that would challenge you on the world being round, right? Because a lot of people out there think the world is flat. <laughs> right? yes. I heard you say that. I'm like, I know yes. a couple of people that I'm like, really? You really is, think is it's it, flat? Isn't Kyrie Irving one of those people who... Uh, oh, I don't know where that comes from. I, <laughs> the I, world is flat. It's, I don't know. The world might as well be flat as how odd it is to me. So, no. well, But you people, nailed it, Ricky. We're an hour into this almost. Yeah. There are not a lot of people listening, period. <laughs> so I think... You and they I are, love us, man. They love this outfit right here. They you, love it. You, you and I are talking to each other and, and maybe my parents at this point. Oh. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's the fifth question, Pete. Uh, it, it's uh, It was a great time over at Disrupt HR Orlando. The next one we have, you're definitely going to be in the speaker ring, uh, and you're going to love it. You're going to love it. Four PBD. Corner Resources was represented uh, heavily there, so we really had a blast uh, um, over on Monday. And the next one, you're definitely in. Awesome. Well, thank you. Um, this was good. Hopefully, I, I did okay. Did I make the HR cut? Am I am I HR worthy? Oh, or Man, we're almost an hour into it. That means we did a great job. Because if you didn't, this would have been over in 10 minutes, Pete. Perfect. <laughs> it would have been over in awesome. 10 minutes. <laughs> All well, right, if, folks. If, if anyone out there has questions, we'd love to hear hear from you. Hire calling, H-I-R-E, calling at fourcornerresources.com. Any, any suggestions you have, uh, topics or just questions, we will address them and answer them. We'd love to hear from you. And please rate and review us. If you are That's still right. hanging around, you must have liked it well enough to do that, and we would appreciate it. So thanks, and, uh, and we'll look forward to talking again soon. Roger that, folks. Thank you very much for listening. It's about that time. You guys have a good one. Drive safe. Good night.